السلام علیکم گائز گائز یوزلی یہ ہوتا ہے کہ ہمارے شوز پہ جو ہمارے گیسٹس ہوتے ہیں وہ پاکستان سے ہوتے ہیں تو ہم لوگ اردو میں اپنے شوز کرتے ہیں بٹ آج تھوڑا ڈفرینٹ ہے دس از یونیک یہ آپ جو آج ایکسپیرینس کریں گے تھوڑا ڈفرینٹ ہوگا کیونکہ آج ہمارے جو گیسٹ ہیں وہ بہت اسپیشل ہیں بہت پرولیج ہیں ہمارے لیے ایک آنر کی بات ہے ہمارے جو گیسٹ ہیں امریکہ سے آئے ہیں اور پاکستان میں ایک انڈسٹری کو پروموٹ کرنے کے لیے آئے ہیں آج ہم ان سے انگلش میں بات کریں گے اور اپنا سیشن اسٹارٹ کریں گے As I told you that uh, the guests that we have have came from long way from America. So, uh, you know, I don't have the words to explain. Uh, they have came from so long. They are really special for us. They are, you know, the heart of our industry. I welcome Mr. Jamal English, the CEO of uh, EDM Network and Mr. Rita Luch, the president of EDM Net- Network. Welcome you both of you guys. Thank you Thank for you having us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Okay. Okay, guys. Uh, before we proceed, what is the story of your lives prior to two of you, you know, parting with each other? Really, go ahead. Go ahead, brother Jamal. You go ahead, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to uh, be part of this setting here at uh, NextGen, uh, a great company with a great leader. Um, each and every one of us in life had a journey uh, that led us to uh, who we are today. Uh, and all of those experiences in life have molded us to uh, the man and woman that we are today. Uh, And for me, um, you know, I grew up in Algeria, uh, which is in North Africa. And uh, Alhamdulillah, you know, I grew up a very, very poor child. Uh, My father was a great father. My mom was a great mom, but um, they were poor. So we had 13 kids in my family and we had only uh, two bedrooms. So uh, growing up, uh, I thought that all the people uh, lived like that because, you know, I didn't have anything to compare it with. So... uh, Um, you know when you have six seven people sleeping in one room that's what I thought you know because I haven't seen anything else so I can compare it to what we had but the one thing that we had was alhamdulillah you know the faith uh, the unity of the family and the love uh, but I remember uh, growing up uh, you know brother Malik I remember growing growing up in Algeria um, I was just this poor kid uh, you know uh, that was rich in vision I remember when I was very young you know I, I told my mom that uh, you know I'm definitely going uh, to America uh, so I can take care of you and the family even though when I was young but uh, I was uh, lucky enough you know to have an, uh, an aunt who lived in the US and she told my mom I can give him a better life so I came here very very young and uh, since I came uh, to uh, the United States um, you know I started at a young age uh, you know going to school and hustling at the same time I started working doing uh, car washes, delivering newspaper, um, just to make a buck, just to make money because I wanted my family to be proud of me. So, um, you know, growing up very poor, it was very hard for me to learn anything at school. Um, as Allah knows, you know, I didn't have money to buy pen or paper or uh, books. Um, so it was really hard for me. But when I came here, I had a better chance. I went to school, I studied. And, um, you know, at a young age, Um, I had a lot of anger in me because I was far away from my family even though I used to go and visit but I have a lot of anger so I I turned that anger into bodybuilding Um, so you know I'd rather hit the machine hard than hit somebody hard right so I started doing bodybuilding I've done a lot of competitions and then you know um, I got in 
into um, the insurance business and that's where I met uh, my brother Jamal you know we teamed up together we started doing things together and uh, when we started we started from the bottom uh, hold on we believed in each other hold on he said prior to when we met okay right he said prior so let me take over now you guys so my story is I come from the US actually born in Florida um, a family of four my dad died when I was very young um, it was very hard um, my mom struggled to figure out how to provide for the family up until she met my stepfather um, and it makes me a little bit emotional because he took us in as if we were his own treated us like his own raised us as his own and when I was seven years old we started working in his businesses he taught me how to work he taught me the values that go into hard work why it's so important and wallahi my parents had CPS called on them when I was young which is child protective services and what CPS didn't like was the fact that my parents had me leaving elementary school to go to work and we used to get out of school at two o'clock and then we used to work until about nine o'clock at night and then get home, go to sleep, wake up at 6 a.m., do it all over again. And this was six days a week. The only day I had off was Sunday. And, um, you know, that was just how life was. And I personally thought that was normal. But as I started to get older, I realized more and more that I was different from the other kids. It was hard to relate to a lot of the kids my age because they didn't have the values of work and the responsibilities that I had to carry myself um, when I was young. So when everybody else was staying after school or going to parties, I was going to work. And um, it made it very hard, you know, especially to, you know, make friends and, um, you know, relate to people. It was just something that, that wasn't very normal. So I had a path. I knew that I wanted to get out. I wanted to figure things out very quickly. And, um, you know, my parents had a different rule. When you turn 18, you grown, you gone. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> there was no staying with them after you turn 18. You're an adult. My parents did not want any adults in their house. They wanted kids. Uh, but I had a different strategy. Um, I went to go see my counselor one day in high school, uh, probably about my freshman year or so. And I said, what's the fastest pathway for me to graduate as quickly as possible? Uh, alhamdulillah, I ended up graduating at the age of 16 from uh, school. Uh, I ended up starting to go to university, learning some fundamentals of business um, from a higher level perspective. And what I realized very quickly from going to school was what they taught in the books wasn't very practical to what I saw from my father executing the real day-to-day -day business in real life. And I said, this isn't it. And um, I was faced with the path. I had two options. I either took over the family business or I chose my own path. And, um, you know, I saw very early in my life that um, I wasn't ready to take over my family businesses. Um, I wasn't humble enough to lead the business that my father has worked his whole life to build um, in order to make it more prosperous. If anything, I would have just maintained what he already did. If not, it would have probably went down. So I made the choice. I asked my parents to sign for me to go to the military. Um, ended up joining the military uh, very early and I did radiology in the military and also while I was in the military I studied for my insurance license and I got my real estate license. I got those two licenses at the same time. Uh, they were night schools and the military had this program if you got any um, higher level certifications they would do a reimbursement for you mm. and I was like awesome I'm gonna do everything I can <laughs> so I got my insurance license I got my real estate license and um, at that point I had to kind of choose a path and um, the path that I ended up choosing was uh, insurance and the reason why I chose insurance was 
I had this big, big, big aspiration of being a money manager. I wanted to be an asset manager. I thought those guys made all the money. They had all the nice cars and all of the Wall Street movies. I wanted to be that guy. And um, unfortunately, I realized very quickly that um, it lacked one fundamental thing in business that's very important, which is scalability, okay? It lacked scalability, which is a fundamental principle for me um, in any business or venture that Rita and I do together. Uh, making sure that whatever we do, there's a level of scale to it. And I realized that the money that I was able to make was completely dependent on me doing the work to make it. And I didn't like that. Uh, I didn't like that. And then I met this mentor that introduced me to Final Expense. And this is kind of where I learned the transactional nature of business. Instead of us trying to, you know, struggle and, you know, go out and um, hustle friends and family, there was actually a model to the business where you could buy leads, go see people that raised their hand and said, I'm interested, and then sell them and make money. And this was very predictable, which was very hard in the asset management business because it was very relationship based. So if you didn't have those relationships established, there was no way for you to be able to really kind of build a business. Mm -hmm. So your pipeline had to be very big and it was stretched out over a very long time. And this is where the sales cycle and final expense is, is one day. But in asset management is, let's call it 180 days. So if you could imagine, you know, the commissions are bigger over here, but they take much longer to come. The commissions are smaller over here, but we can do more, we can do them faster. And um, I had an issue as we started to produce business, and that issue became um, where I was going to be able to procure my leads, because um, procurement is very important. And at the time, return rates were so low in the state of Arizona where I live, um, that where Rita, for example, would pay $30 for a lead in his market, that same lead would cost me 60 or $70 in my market. And the conversion rates weren't much better. So the only difference was my CPA was higher than his. So I had to figure out very early how to actually generate my own leads. And believe me, I tried everything. And this was actually my first introduction to telemarketing. Um, but before that, I actually uh, started running ads on Facebook. And I started advertising on Facebook when their ad platform first came out. Nobody was doing it. And I was really able to figure it out very quickly and there was less rules too so you know it made it a whole lot easier to to really kind of generate the business generate the leads and it just made the whole process a whole lot simpler and um, I was able to generate leads at very low rates it was probably less than two dollars a lead as far as what the average lead cost was that I was able to generate at the time and my CPAs were you know like 50 bucks okay we, we we're gonna talk about that you know later in the interview so the next question is when did you guys arrive to Pakistan? We came um, five days ago. Five days ago? Yeah, we, we came five days ago in June and uh, thank God the weather is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's always nice and hot but, but we love it. For us, you know, Pakistan because, you know, um, it's our home away from home because we work with a lot of call centers so they are like our friends and family we talk to them every day so when we come here we can love it okay how long are you going to stay in Pakistan uh, probably for another couple weeks um, is what our intentions are honestly it seems like we may be here a little bit longer Rita uh, yeah, <laughs> what well, we initially yeah, we planned really we, really um, we have a lot of friends and yeah um, so we're probably going to be here as long as it takes honestly uh, in order to get the work done that we need to get done um, mm -hmm. we're probably going to be here as long as it takes honestly okay at the start I said EDM network so what is that EDM network? EDM network stands for uh, Evolving Distribution Media. Uh, because as we know, uh, and I will let uh, you know, Brother Jamal here talks a little bit more into depth, but uh, we, we, we understood at the beginning of our business relationship is that everything is evolving. Like, you know, today I'm doing this vertical, tomorrow tomorrow you're gonna do another vertical, the next you're gonna do not, another vertical, just like, uh, you know, just like the weather, um, just like the days of the month, they are not all the same. One is warmer than the other, one is hotter. Um, so uh, 
we had to um, evolve with the demand. One day you have uh, a higher demand on file expense, and then you have AEP that comes in that there is a higher demand um, on Medicare, and then you have open enrollment for uh, health insurance. You have much higher demand on ACA, which is uh, Obamacare. So EDM is an evolving distribution marketplace, and I'll let Jamal talk a little bit more on uh, how we got to uh, to become EDM because we you know we started slower but alhamdulillah today we are you know one of the largest distributor of uh, prospect in USA Mr. Jamal what do you say what what it what is EDM uh, EDM is everything EDM is the future EDM cares um, EDM is love EDM is loyalty EDM is trust um, yeah. For me, EDM is um, it's, it's, I can't, it's hard to articulate, um, honestly. And um, you know, at its core, what, exactly what Rita said, evolving distribution media. This entire business journey for us has been an evolution. Um, we all evolve, both for the positive, for the negative, um, but it's a part of life. And um, if we don't evolve, we get left behind. And we must keep that in mind for everything that we do. Um, and if we don't acknowledge that, that's where we start to have the biggest issues. So when you think about EDM, there's a couple ways that you can see it. Some see us as a, as a buyer, um, some see us as a client, some see us as a partner, some see us as a vendor. But at its core, we're a media company. Okay, we focus on live transfers, inbound calls, and digital form fields for everything insurance, home services, and financial services. Okay, and underneath those three industries, we have multiple verticals. And it's really kind of dependent on what you need. If we're able to understand a campaign, understand the distribution of a campaign, understand the need of a campaign, then we build a campaign. And that's kind of how we work. Okay, for the viewers, in how many countries uh, EDM is operating at the moment? <laughs> I would say each and every continent, as uh, as you can see, <laughs> you know, Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Rabbil Alameen. I mean, you know, the blessings and uh, the risk comes from Allah Azza wa Jalla. So we say Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen before anything. But uh, we are in almost every continent. We haven't went to Antarctica because it's cold <laughs> and it snows. <laughs> but uh, you know, as as you know, we we, we did our uh, African tour and then we did our U European tour. Now we are doing our Asian tour. We're gonna go from, uh, you know, Pakistan or the great country of Pakistan to India to Philippines, and then we have to go back to Africa, Egypt, and Morocco, and then I have to go back to Algeria, and then Jamal is going to visit our partners in uh, in uh, Barcelona. Uh, there is a convention there, and he's gonna see two centers we work with over there on the Spanish market. Uh, and me, I stay in Algeria to see my great mother. God bless her. She's 85. I love you, mom. Um, so we we try to uh, reach and lend a hand to anyone who wants to work, and we know that a lot of a lot of countries are struggling. And uh, Alhamdulillah, you know, as a Muslim nation, uh, we need to help one another and work with one another and my Allah you know sees that as uh, as barakah as sadaqah so I would say we are in all continents but uh, alhamdulillah you know 70% of our business is with our Muslim brothers and sisters okay Jamal when did you guys start lead generation business in Pakistan um, this probably started back in 2016, mm -hmm. probably back in 2016 is when we first started. Um, and this is kind of where we need to kind of supplement. So early on, um, you know, Rita and I, we had an agency, um, we had separate agencies. My agency was doing this thing, Rita's agency was doing this thing. Um, we met at a conference and um, this is kind of where this brotherhood was established. And Rita was a speaker. And, you know, you see how swaggy he is and how eloquent he is, and he's a hustler. No, wallahi, Rita's the biggest hustler I've ever met in my life. And um, he taught me something that day. He said, 
knock like the police service like a fireman. And it was the most profound thing I've ever heard in my life. Because in my business, my business was predicated off of appointments. So if you didn't say you wanted to see me, I didn't come see you. And I was only able though to see probably about 30% of the leads that I got. And the other 70%, uh, I really didn't do nothing with them. I really didn't do nothing with them. And, and this is the problem when you're able to have leads at such a low cost, you don't waste time. And um, when Rita taught me that, I was like, man, I'm leaving so much on the table, so much on the table. So um, Rita, what did I say to you when uh, I walked up to you at the show? Yeah, he says, I love you. <laughs> what else? Um, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, uh, it's true, like J J Jamal, um, he, you know, even at that time he was one of the smartest guys I met because when we met, um, it's true that uh, I was generating a lot of sales, but at the end of the day, he was netting more than me. So uh, he said, you know, um, you know, he told me, you know, you are, you, you are selling more than me, but I'm making more than you. And I looked at him like, you know, this guy is crazy or he's genius. And, um, you know, he said, I can generate the leads that you're buying for $35 for like $1.50 and I couldn't believe it. So um, he was one of the first guys doing Facebook ads when people didn't even know what Facebook is. So um, I said, look, you know, show me what you can do. And, and, and he did, you know, and he showed me his genius. You know, he, he got me like 800 leads for like 500 bucks. I thought they were fake leads. I couldn't believe it. And I started door knocking and I, I think I wrote like $60,000 and I just, I went to him and I said, would you marry me? He had the best <laughs> month ever. He had the best month ever. I had and, the biggest um, month ever. That's true. And he, he changed my perspective completely on how the business structure should look. And um, this is kind of where we started our agency model together. And um, we said we're either going to do it all together or not at all. Mm -hmm. And um, so we merged forces at that point and we introduced the model that was very simple. Um, while we were producing, um, we only saw appointments. Anybody that we weren't able to see, we gave to our downline agents. Once Rita and I built up enough agents within our agency, our top performers got to see all the appointments. And then our new agents were working all the leads that we weren't able to set appointments with. And this allowed us to compound the production that we were actually doing, um, which changed everything for us. Um, Fast forward, we ended up um, scaling that up, we sold that business, and then we started our first call center. And this is kind of where PK came in the fold because um, Facebook at that point was starting to have new competitors entering the market. People were starting to teach some of the tricks that I was taking advantage of for such a long time. Costs started to go up, um, conversion rates start to drop, and this is starting to be where the telemarketing leads came into play because we were starting to buy the callback leads. We were buying callback leads at the time, um, and we were just having all that stuff funnel into the center, and you know, Rita and I acknowledged that if we were going to have a problem of either having too many leads or not enough leads, we'd rather have too much than not enough. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's the best problem to have. But because we were closing the business and we knew how the actual marketing was performing, it was much easier to talk to you know our friends and other partners in the business about you know what really made sense and um, so we started to sell the excess to them and that was just the beginning and then from there we still kept growing our agency and our call center that was something that was we were still doing um, but at the same time Rita for all the listeners out there he speaks 12 languages he speaks 12 languages. So um, Rita was already traveling the world at that time, um, going to North Africa, going to Europe, um, going to some other Muslim countries in the Middle East. Uh, but then he started saying, look, let's go where we're getting these telemarketing leads. And this is where he made his first trip to Pakistan. Um, at that time, we didn't know too many people. I think we only had like, what, three or four people yeah. for that whole trip. We had like three or yeah, four we, we, we were <laughs> big, we were big on the callbacks. Yeah. Because at that time, you know, the life transfers weren't big. Yeah. Everybody was doing callback. Mm -hmm. That was way, way back. 